Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show. Appreciate you joining us today as we continue to celebrate the men and women who are working so hard to make this such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, I've had a string of really, really good shows recently. I have really enjoyed, in fact, uh, zeroing in on a new strategy that Super Talk Mississippi News has where we're having these contributors uh, we call them thought leaders from across the state. A, a number of them are from coastal Mississippi. And just recently, for for example, Rob Siegler, who's been an editor at multiple newspapers across the state and works these days with Crews in the Coast. Uh, Aaron Rossetti, who is a leader in the Coast Young Professionals Organization. Um, both of those are, are terrific thought leaders. They both wrote terrific pieces. And so not only do they write for Super Talk Mississippi News and it goes across the state, but it creates a great opportunity for them not only to join me on the Ricky Matthews show, but also to join our other statewide uh, shows as well. So great, great chance for us to you know, put some really good leaders on display across the state. Had a terrific conversation earlier this week with Jamie Miller the new uh, CEO of the Coast Business Council. He's been in that position for six months. Time has gone by really quickly. But we got a chance to talk about the Gulf Coast Business Council, what they do, why they are important. And uh, if you really want to understand more about the Business Council, go watch that conversation with Jamie Miller. You can go to Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast, and I think you'll be glad that you did. And by the way, last but certainly not least, Jeff Duncan, uh, who is a columnist and writer for NOLA.com and the Times Picayune, we worked together when I was the publisher and president of NOLA Media Group in the Times Picayune and NOLA.com when I was in New Orleans. And uh, he continues to, to join me in my show every single Friday and has done that now for almost three years. Jeff's, Jeff's the ultimate insider with the Saints and Pelicans and other sports. And uh, we're really, really lucky to have him. So, if you uh, if you want to know the latest and you really want to get some insider information about how things are going with the Saints, especially especially given this offseason, which has been super active, go listen to that conversation with Jeff Duncan. Uh, I think you'll be glad you did. And he joins me every single Friday here at 103.1. Of course, you can go to Facebook or YouTube or your favorite podcast, as I mentioned. Um, now, look, we're going to shift gears now and move over to my friend, uh, Wendy Sweatman, who is the uh, CEO of Sweatman Security, longtime friend. I've known him in the community for many, many years. He's been an elected official. He's worked in the private sector. He is incredibly committed to the community, and I always enjoy the times we visit together. So, Wendy, how you doing, my friend? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Good morning. Good to see you. Well, okay, so Wendy and I both live on the North Shore of Back Bay. So when I leave my house and head toward Ocean Springs, I pass this house on the way. And uh, usually, you know, it's interesting. About 50% of the time I'll see, you know, family members out gallivanting in the backyard doing something, either boating or around the pool, working in the yard, whatever you guys do. But it's fun to have life on Back Bay, isn't it? I tell you, it really is. And there's there's always life on Back Bay. There's Even through the nights, I love to see the barges as they come down. They're all lit up. It's beautiful. And uh, being a kid that grew up just a few blocks off the south side of the bay, kind of near where the old the IP casino is, that's where I was born and raised. You know, I'd take my little Zebco ride and go down there, you know, and put in. And I'm still fishing in those muddy waters. And it's uh, it's just a real blessing to be able to live there. Well, I, w I was raised in Bellevue. Uh, Bellevue. So let's see. Um, people in my class that lived within a block of me, uh, Farrell Allman from SF Allman, Roy Anderson, you know, his father, Roy Anderson, we, we know him as the third, uh, but his father and mother lived a block in the other direction. And Numerous others right here. Riley Morris, you know, you know, lawyer here in coastal Mississippi. He's made so many uh, contributions over the years. But Farrell lived on the on the bayou, so we lived across the street from Farrell. So I would go talking about the Zebco man. I would spend a lot of time in Farrell's backyard catching mullet and bass and gar and you know who knows what else. And we uh, spent a lot of time skiing and whatever. But it, you know, I guess that's life in coastal Mississippi. Most people who live here. If you don't live on the water, you find it pretty quickly, and, that, and that's basically the way it works, isn't it? I didn't grow up on the water. I was a few blocks off, and you know, as soon as we were old enough and we could get out there in a skiff and start pulling people on a tube or skiing, and you know, I mean, some of my best memories are in the summer with my friends, and you know, just all the knucklehead things that you know, middle school and high school boys do out there. <laughs> it's just good times. 
I said it a bunch of times, man. It's a miracle some of us are still alive <laughs> because we we didn't have we worry about everything today. But I, I don't. I, I was talking to my mother recently, and I said, "Mom, gosh, how, she said, well, you know, we had the woods in the backyard, and you just you went through the woods and found your friends, and y'all built forts and." At the end of the day, when some uh, when the street lights came on, is when we had to be back home again. And, and man, I, I don't know if I could live in a world where the, there was that much freedom in our kids. Uh, but it is a different world, unfortunately, isn't it? It is a way different world. I, I, I told people when I was growing up, it was almost like Mayberry, because within one block of our house was St. John's Church, which is Blessed Silos now. You had the fire station. You had the baseball park. And then two blocks over on Fayard was Bird's Grocery. And you had William Bird, and you had a butcher shop in the back. His brother Rocky was up front. I mean, that's that was right there where I lived, you know? And yeah. It was just a, a wonderful time to grow up, a wonderful neighborhood to grow up in Biloxi right there. And uh, I just have such fond memories. Yeah, and, and by the way, if, if Ann, my wife Ann, who is a Bahanovich, were sitting here with me, she would say the same thing, man. I mean, they spend a lot of time fishing and and uh, enjoying the outdoors, and you know they they just, you know their life centered around the Slavonian Lodge, and of course, you know most of the boys worked in the seafood factories coming up. You know that was the way they earned some extra money while they were in school. But uh, you know, life in Black Sea wasn't so bad. It's still not so bad, man. But you got you got to be a little bit more careful today. And uh, we as parents are a little bit more protective, probably than than back in those days. Not that they weren't protected, but they didn't they didn't have the the uh, ills of society to deal with so much so that we have to today. That's for sure, man. Your business. We've we spent the whole show together talking about your business and your mother's commitment to the community and how she sort of bred that in you and how incredibly committed you are to the community. But why don't you remind people about Sweatman Security, what it's all about, how big it is, where you do business across the state. I think people will be impressed if they don't know that already. Well, you know, it's a good American story, I believe. Two people in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1973, uh, just working hard. And, you know, our general philosophy is just be nice, work hard. And so through the years, we've had opportunities to work in, um, you know, private and public sectors, working for municipalities, counties, the state, and then working in uh, like the Southern Company, Mississippi Power, and we Chevron, DuPont, um, Mississippi Port. You know, these are all been opportunities that were afforded to us as, for the company to grow and kind of spread our wings, so to speak. And then over the last decade, there's been a uh, an increase in a, where we've gone out and got into event work. And that's where we work at Oh, you, you really see us a lot because it's it's large venues where people are going. That, and so that's why in the last decade, I guess, you've seen Sweatman a lot more uh, because you weren't just coming through a gate at a shipyard, but you were going to a concert or a fair or a ball game or something. And you saw that events division. And that's the different universities uh, in Mississippi, some in Alabama, Louisiana, uh, where we've kind of spread out and been able to work. And, and that's where there's a lot of, um, you know, seasonal part-time labor, uh, that we blend in with full-time labor, uh, and it just, uh, it's a big logistics, you know, puzzle to make all that work. Did you ever, in your wildest imagination, though, when you think about where Sweatman started and what it became, because, you know, we, you, you know, Sweatman provided services for the Sun-Herald along the way, um, what it, I mean, this multi-state company that is, uh, I, you know, the, when you say big events, when you're talking about doing an SEC football game, that's a big deal. I mean, you're not talking about just a couple of people. This is a big undertaking that you might have simultaneous efforts like that going on at one time. It's uh, it's turned into a pretty significant company, hasn't it? It has. I mean, we've uh, we try to keep the same philosophy, though. I mean, we're a family-owned and operated business. Uh, we care about our employees. We care about the team, you know, that we've been able to, you know, come and build. And that's really what it's about. I mean, it's having a relationship with the community, having a relationship with your clients, and then building a really solid team that your clients can depend on. And, and that's what it's come down to, you know. And we've um, we've kind of been careful in the growth part of it. Uh, you know, we just we're not out there trying to kill it in every market. There's certain things that we want to do and do it well. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, Kevin Felsher, you know, Kevin, he's one of our state representatives now. Kevin and I were talking when I opened the Jackson office up 
And he told me, he said, Wendy, a uh, little advice, you know, just be careful that, you know, that really good restaurant that you love and everybody goes there and then they decide to open up another one. And then it's just a, a watered down, you know, version of what the original one was. And he said, uh, I've just seen that happen to other friends and businesses. Just be careful. And I've always kind of kept that in the back of my mind that I don't want a watered down version of what we are here in our corporate office in Biloxi, Mississippi. So we try to, uh, at this point, we really want to do a really good job. I want to make sure that I'm always accessible. <laughs> and that's the secret sauce. Yeah, it, it really is. We're talking with uh, Wendy Sweatman, longtime community leader. He's the CEO of Sweatman Security. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. We'll see you after this. Welcome back to my show, and uh, and also help me welcome back my friend Wendy Sweatman, who is the CEO of Sweatman Security Service, and someone who has been a longtime friend of mine. He's super, super dedicated to the community. You know, when we're talking about expansion of your business, uh, I thought Kevin Felcher had really good advice for you. And I, I, I say that from a point of view of having had tremendous experience with this, because as a CEO for a media company, I oversaw uh, major media companies over multiple states uh, that, had, that, that had subdivisions of those companies that went across their states. And, uh, you know, I came across a book and for people, business leaders who are, who are listening to this, if you haven't read a book called Built to Last, it's an extremely good book. And essentially what it says is that some companies that expand, they do so, so because they have a charismatic leader that leads them and they can expand fast and they can do amazing things. But when the charismatic leader goes away, then they're kind of lost without a rudder. And the point that Built to Last uh, makes, and it does this based on really very significant research, is that the companies that are really built to last are the ones that can sustain themselves once that charismatic leader is gone. And essentially what they're saying is, what are the core values that are built into the company? And if you can build those core values into the company, and when you expand, you transfer those to this new company, and you continue to do that, you can't do it too quickly because you'll lose sight of what those core, those initial core values are. What I, what I was interesting about what you were saying to, before we actually got into this discussion about expansion and before we, you made the point about Kevin Felcher saying don't don't go too fast where you end up watering down what makes Sweatman so unique is that you you sort of understood that when you first talked about what you're what you're what you want to do that what's guiding you is this family business and um, and so some very specific core values that you talked about, and that's actually served you well, hasn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, we we are never is it lost that the South Mississippi is home, and South Mississippi has allowed us to grow. You know, our friends. You know, Ricky. It's so important the relationships, and you know, if if not for South Mississippi, there'd be no sweat, and we know that. And so that's why it's so important for us to give back, to be in the community, um, to serve. You know, my father has served in an elected position. I have uncles that have served in elected positions. I myself have served in an elected position. And then to continue that, our, our public service, you don't have to hold that public position to be a public servant. And I hope that I've been a good example over the last eight years. I've been out of public office, but I've never stopped serving. And that's what our work with. Boys and Girls Club or Salvation Army, um, the local uh, homeless coalition, the missions that are here running the cold weather shelters, um, just making sure that, you know, we give back uh, to those in the community that need a voice. They need someone there to help help them a helping hand. We all need that, quite frankly, in one way or the other. You know, um, we're going to talk about, you know, parts in this country with violence and things that are going on. But a lot of that is a spinoff from mental illness, desperation, hard socioeconomic times. And so how do you insulate in a community when you need people that we're lifting each other up? You know, there's hope. Uh, there's yeah. care. We're caring for people, you know? Well, look, you know, it's interesting because um, I had a terrific mentor in Roland Weeks and early in my career, you know, honestly, he saw, saw things in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself and then helped me understand that I had good capabilities to do things. But one of the one of the things he really pushed me on is to be heavily involved in the community because the extent to which I was involved in the community, this, this is true of a business owner, but it's especially true of a newspaper publisher where you're trying to 
you know, your involvement in the community is helping to inform you that the newspaper is reflecting back to the community, that you're not losing sight of where the challenges and opportunities might be in the community. And that the extent that you're, the, to which you're willing to be engaged in the community, you're much better community leader because you can really understand what you just said. And that is, for example, the, the issue of violent crime, which we will get to in a second, you think about what's causing that. And usually it's rooted back, as you pointed out, to, to mental health, to challenges in families, to unemployment, to... You, you name it. It, it. It's complicated. And so the more that you're involved in, for example, the homeless community and the homeless coalition and helping helping to feed people when it's cold outside or whatever it might be, when you go out there and see with your own eyes the people who are engaged in these, the people who are trying to survive in their lives, it does inform you in ways that change you as a leader, doesn't it, Wendy? Absolutely. You got I was, I was, you to spend time with people, Ricky. That's the most important thing we have. The most valuable thing we have is our time, right? You can't get it back. And so these cold weather shelters, you know, I've spent the night in them, plenty of nights. Over the last decade, I've been running the shelter. Sit and talk to people. Listen to their stories. You know, some are just sad stories, and they're, they're, they're full of it, right? you, you got to wade through it. There's a lot of, lot of people, though, the majority, that there was something in their life significant that triggered that homelessness. And talking with the coalition, I've learned a lot about if you can get to someone within a year, of them being homeless and get them back on their feet, do you have a drastic amount of opportunity and, and statistically for them to be successful? But if they're over a year, they lose hope mm-hmm. and it's hard to get them back on their feet. Uh, so it really does. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me in touch with the community, what people are really feeling uh, in the community, and then how can we help? Them, you know, true needs. Yeah, I had, gosh, I, throughout my career, I had so many, so many examples of when you get deep into a community, how it changes your perspective about things. Um, I, I, a couple of really interesting moments that stick out to me. One is when I was leading the oil recovery efforts as a, as a volunteer for Governor Raleigh in Alabama. As we were putting our plan together, one of the things we wanted to do is have a series of public meetings, which we had. And one of them was down in Bala Battery. And, man, I mean, hundreds of people came, and we had translators from not only Vietnamese but Cambodian and other uh, dialects there. We had um, – and once once this meeting was over with, everyone that was involved – because I, I really pushed hard that we've got to do this. They came back and said, my gosh, you know, the plan is going to be so much better as a result of what we just did. I had a – right after Hurricane Katrina, the first public meeting that was held – and uh, and what was a church, but it was an open air pavilion because it had a roof, but you know obviously it was washed out. That's where we had the first public meeting after Hurricane Katrina in Hancock County for the governor's commission. And after the meeting, a woman st- stayed, and I noticed she was kind of hovering. We were doing a little debriefing afterwards, and finally I walked over to her and said, "Man, can I help you?" And she said, "Yeah." She said, "Look, see that van right there?" I said, "Yes, ma'am." She said, "That's the, that's all I have in my life now. My homes and all my family's were, homes were washed away." And she said, "You know, the main thing I want to make sure you heard is that in the future, please make sure that the governor's commission report has something about prepositioning boats. Excuse me, excuse me, prepositioning buses. So that because too many people I know didn't have gas in their car, and they couldn't get out, so too many people were challenged. Too many people died, and in the future, we just got to do a better job of prepositioning buses. And when, and then she, I watched her go back to. Her, I thanked her and I hugged her. She got back in her van and she drove away. And I thought, my God, I will never forget this. I mean, just you know, you never know where that magic moment's going to come. That's not only going to help you make your plan better, but it's also going to tell you why it's important to listen to what people are going through in the community. And that, man, once you do that, dude, you get stuck, don't you? I mean, you can't walk away from it anymore, can you? I cannot. And, you know, Ricky, the legacy we live to is I hope that I have two sons, 22 and 14. And I hope that, you know, I can show them that compassion, that dedication, that, you know, we're very blessed. And and there is a responsibility that comes with that. And so my sons, my nieces and nephews, our family, it's just so important to me to be able to lead them. And then if we can exemplify that to the community and inspire others to get involved and, and just do little things to show that you care, it, it just it, it just adds up. You know, it adds up. Well, look, one, one of the reasons why 
And I've said this a bunch of times, uh, but I, it's, it's worthy of being repeated. It's one of the reasons why I decided in retirement to do, do this show is so that you and I can have a conversation like we're having now. So people hopefully can be inspired by it and say, you know what, I got to do more. I got to pay more attention. I got to find an organization where I can flex some muscles and use my skill sets to improve an area of the community. And I can assure you, anyone who's listening to this now who is not already involved in a very significant way, or maybe you know you can be involved more, uh, to listen to this conversation and realize that it made us be- We got more from it. I can tell you in the thousands of hours that I've given to the community over my career, I got way more from it than I gave. I, I just can tell you that, man. I'm a better person for it. And the fact that you and I can have a conversation like we're having today and maybe inspire others to say, you know what, I got to double down or maybe I got to get involved. And, and to know that doing so will make you not only a better person because you've contributed to the community, but you're going to be a better person because you're going to be more complete. You're going to understand that a community like ours always has needs. Always, There's always gaps to fill. There's never enough people. We don't have enough volunteers. We don't have enough leaders. It's complex. But the more of those we have, the better off this community is going to be. I'll get your reaction to that on the other side. Uh, but we're talking with uh, Wendy Swetman, who's the CEO of Swetman Security, a longtime community leader, a good friend of mine, and someone I really enjoy visiting with. We'll see you with Wendy after this. Welcome back to my show. Appreciate you joining us today. I have Wendy Swetman, who's the CEO of Swetman Security. Um, he's been in public life. He's been in private life, obviously. He's a longtime community leader. But, hey, Wendy, when we went to, to the break, I was just talking about how I hope that when you and I talk about what we get from it and how passionate we are about giving back to the community that inspires other people, I know that that motivates you too. Hopefully, you know you can le- lead by example. That's what your hope is, isn't it? I, I hope. You know, I started in high school I was, with the March of Dimes. You know, that was something I started working on then. And so, I, I, I encourage young people, the youth, their energy, their ideas, their vision. Right? They're fresh. You know, get involved. And all the people I've met that have been able to mentor me too. So if you get in at a young age as well, then you're going to be able to see these other great leaders in the community. You're going to meet them. You're going to get ideas and then you're going to offer ideas. And it takes everybody coming together, not one person or one entity, but entire teams coming together. And then you'll, you'll see it. You'll move the needle. You will change the course of life for somebody. You will change the course of life of the community you live in. Yeah. I I remember back one of the very first, things that I got involved in. Um, I graduated a guy named Michael Martin, and his mother was head of the volunteers and probation program for the Harrison County Family Court for many, many years. And I became a volunteer in probation for the the family court there. And what that involved is sort of almost like a big brother kind of uh, project where you would take a young person under under your wings that may have had some issues along the way, maybe in the process of overcoming some some court challenges and whatever, and you just kind of there for them because in a lot of those cases that they didn't have a good family unit to help with them. In most cases, they had some challenges in their family, whether it be drug or alcohol abuse or maybe one parent or whatever the situation might be. And along the way, actually, um, I got to a point where she would call me when she had a very special, special case because I've been doing it for a while. I remember once a young man who stole a car in in Hancock County, and he was from a really good family, but he just, he stole a car and, and she said, you know, Ricky, I want you to, I want you to spend some time with him. I think you can have an impact on him. And I wish I remembered his name, remember his name today, could be interested to see what, what came with that young man. But, um, but just, just having the opportunity to see the challenges all these young people had to deal with, those challenges, you know, that was back many years ago. Uh, those challenges are exponential today that, that kids in some, some socioeconomic areas have to deal with. And, um, we, again, what I learned about what a volunteer can provide in a case like that is so important. You, you've seen that in so many different ways, haven't you? Hey, well, I've also seen, you know, being in public law enforcement and working in correctional facilities uh, as well, you know, and getting to talk to individuals that are inmates and kind of how they got there, you know. Yeah. They're, yeah. 
lot of the same road, meaning that, you know, they kind of grew up really hard. They were low socioeconomic. They, you know, there was abuse in the family, the mental illness. You know, they, they just like, – back to the hope part of it. They had yeah. no one was encouraging them. No one was there to support them. And so they left them kind of – you know, to an undesirable uh, atmosphere and a life where they just, you know, ended up in some type of cr- criminal activity. Um, you know, the ones that are nonviolent offenders that we had in work centers, you know, they wanted to work. They wanted to contribute. They felt good contributing and having that opportunity. And you could see the change in them. You know, they had something to get up for. They looked forward to it. And, um, and that was a real insight into the human uh, kind of spirit uh, you know, working in and around inmates. Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't know if this started under Larkin Smith. And I know Sh- Sheriff Price uh, along the way. I know there were issues with it and whatever. So set all that aside for a second. But when they were doing their catering business, and and like for a chamber event or maybe cater something for some kind of public event we were going to have at the Sun Herald, we would get to know the inmates. A lot of those inmates would come back time and time again, and you got to know them. It was a it was really personifying, you know, the kind of people that should be given an opportunity to, to succeed in life. But uh, that was really good. I, I guess they don't have a program like that anymore, huh? That um, it was the peanut butter cookies. They were famous everywhere back then. The Sheriff's Department's peanut butter cookies. Uh, yeah. That program went away, uh, and it had to do with just, quite frankly, uh, they were needling the county so much with consultants and federal oversight and that uh, under Sheriff Bristolera's administration, uh, the work center shut down. I would hope to think that, uh, you know, we have a sheriff's race coming up. That's pretty hot and contested right now. But uh, that's something they look at. You know, getting that work center, getting that inmate program started back up, you know, county farm, using them to raise vegetables and things of that nature. It's two prong. One, that it, it does make an economic uh, impact in South Mississippi, working in parks and recreation and utilities and waters and things like that. But two, it, it's a rehabilitation program. It gives individuals an opportunity to feel like they're worth something, they're contributing, you know. So th- that is two prong uh, that's in that. It's a very valuable program. And uh, hopefully we'll see that program again here in South Mississippi. So, Wendy, when you, you know, speaking of violent crime, man, we've just seen such a rise of the kind of crimes that, for example, standing on Highway 90, shooting a gun into a crowd, you know, um, the, the, ha- the issue of the young man from past Christianity went into Hancock County and just shot several people. And. Uh, the the more, more recent government street shooting in Ocean Springs, where it's the same kind of situation, where you've got shooters that really don't seem to care for human life. I, I spent a lot of time with the mayor of of, uh, of New Orleans, Mitch Landry, when I was publisher of the, of the Times Picayune, trying to understand more about this. But as I've often said, it's very complicated. But when you see where we are as a society today, the solutions are in every area that you and I were just talking about. All these nonprofits and efforts that are working together. It, it's it's generational. But when you see it today, how do you analyze it? Well, I think that one, you have a detachment from reality uh, for some of these kids that are growing up because they're sitting in front of computer screens with violent video games uh, that they're engaged in. There's not that personal contact. You know, they have headsets on that they're talking to somebody halfway around the country you know, uh, along that line where you, we were talking about, we were joking, right? About, Hey, when the streetlights came on, you came home, nobody was in the house. Nobody, everybody's mama ran them out the house. And if you sit around, you got a switch, right? So you were coming in there. Now they're in the house and, and it's that social interaction. I think that gets lost, uh, along that line, uh, with people. And then again, we're dealing with mental illness. We're dealing with, you know, uh, folks that, uh, there's red flags that aren't being recognized. And I think in some of these actions that have taken place here lately in South Mississippi, there were definitely red flags uh, that were there uh, along that line. But again, it, it's not, you can't just look at public law enforcement. Those policemen on the street, they got their hands full every day. Those investigators that are back in CID, man, they're, they're, they got uh, caseloads that are sitting on top of caseloads uh, from there. So there's a, there's a lot of other dynamics where we're partnering with mental health, we're partnering with probation, we're partnering you know, with our juvenile detention and, and juvenile justice system, talking to our judges, talking to the counselors, and that 
uh, that we need to do a better job of coming together, sharing information. There's going to be names that are going to come up. We're going to wait, wait a minute, tell me that name. Yep, I had a case that came up. He was a suspect in it, or she was a suspect in it. You know, these kind of things. That's what we've got to do. We've got to get it. We've got a streamlined database and streamline communication. It's going to help us defend our home front here in South Mississippi for sure. Well, what's happening with with a lot of young people? They don't have a mentor in their lives. That's a, a quality, positive mentor in their lives, and they're going to then you you you're running the risk that they're going to find a mentor, and that mentor they find. It's going to steer them in the wrong direction, and it happens awful lot. One of the things that the mayor uh, of New Orleans often told me, and something I've said on the show many times, is that young people in New Orleans, first of all, they're, they're, the, the, those involved in violent crimes are much younger than they used to be. And if there's such a thing as having more deadly weapons, they certainly had them. And then the other problem is it's not like Crips and Bloods. It's uh, neighborhood-based gangs. And... They're very violent and very turf uh, you know, involved, and they're under the young younger they are, the more pressure they're under. And some of them, and he's talked to many of them, they don't even know if they're going to live to tomorrow. They 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 make every decision they made are based on incredible pressure they're under to act based on whatever they're being told to do. And um, and so when you have a young person who's acting based on some pressure that's not good for them. And they don't expect to live tomorrow. Then they're going. They're going to do things that don't seem rational to the rest of us. Right. But and it's a it's a serious serious. I don't know. That's actually just one angle of this. But it is an important angle. It talks a little bit about how violence from the from the big cities are beginning to sort of infiltrate into smaller communities across America. And that's that's part of the reason. Well, I tell you, it's it's extremely alarming. I mean, it, it turns my stomach being in public law enforcement for almost 30 years and, and, and having a big interest in working with youth. I mean, I've worked with kids and in schools and Boys and Girls Club and, you know, starting after school programs uh, to mentor kids, give them opportunities. Uh, again, back to collaborations, back to everybody working together. Yeah, one of the it was interesting because I saw I saw your your conversation on WLX recently and it's kind of like a, as you pointed out, kind of like a terrorist. I mean, so in some cases, we don't know that this event's going to happen. It's that once it does happen, how do we respond to it? We're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get on the other side. But this is Wendy Swetman from Swetman Security, and uh, we'll see you after this break. Welcome back to my show. We're, we're visiting with my friend Wendy Swetman from Swetman Security, a longtime friend, longtime community leader. He's been an uh, uh, elected official in his past, and as he points out, over 30 years in law enforcement community. So there's no way. I mean, when you're, when you're talking about the, what, what you guys do is that's provide service to large events of all kinds of complexions, large events. Boy, this has got to be, you know, this notion of violent crime, violent, you know, acts has to be on your mind all the time. You're having to train people for it. You're having to think about it a lot. And anytime you bring, you congregate people together, like recently we had with the with the spring break activities, uh, it's got to just make you scared to death of what's going to happen. Absolutely. And, you know, there are things out of our control. But what we have to be as prepared as we can when these events occur, meaning when you have a violent uh, action, and then how do we respond to it? And then as a community, how do we respond to it, right? Where people know to get low, to barricade themselves in. You know, you saw these 911 calls that were coming out from different, these malls here recently of people saying, hey, we're we're in the bathroom at this place. And they're telling, right, lock the door, barricade, stay low. You know, being aware of what your surroundings are. I talked about, you know, As I walk through a mall or somewhere, I'm always looking around. I got my head on a swivel of where if something like that happened, where am I going to put my family at? You know, where where is their cover that can prevent them from being shot, Uh, you know, versus concealment where that's just where you can hide. Right. And sometimes there's not. hide. You've got to be keeping your mind going to understand. You know, I talked about we have to do this in layers. You know, how do we protect large events? How do we protect public places? Well, you know, we utilize opportunities where there's no substitute for uniform law enforcement presence. That's the number one deterrent right there. Magnetometers, you know, individuals going through there, we're screening them going through there. But at the end of the day, if you've got someone that's skilled and they know how to circumvent, you know, the system, they're going to be able to uh, from there. You've seen where you've had these individuals that were violent. We had happened to us in Jackson, Mississippi at the Mudbug Festival a few years ago, you might recall. We had a shooting 
our sweatman security guards were 15 feet from a guy that pulled an automatic weapon out. But thank God there was a law enforcement officer right there as well that was able to stop the threat. He was able to send bullets back the other direction. And um, that saved a lot of lives that day in Jackson, Mississippi. Since then, they have come ramped more police officers, more security, magnetometers, you know, changed some of the hours that they operate. You know, they looked at where the highest potential was for these uh, occurrences to happen and then try to mitigate that, get a plan, you know. It's tough. Um, you know, and the, the issue with the spring break issue that we had recently it kind of felt like a powder keg. I mean, in so many ways, because you see these guns went off more than once. And um, how do you stop that, Wendy? Well, I think that, you know, one, spreading the event out, right? So I think there's good things happening in the city hall right now. They're trying to get a hold of it where, and say, okay, it's an event. Let's make it an event. All right, let's get permits. Let's get ahead of the game. Let's see where we can spread it out along South Mississippi so it's not such a large group congregated in one location, which the Coliseum in that area around the Coliseum within that one mile stretch east and west has kind of been the largest hub of that. And so that started the, you know, that conversation, right? Move it out a little bit. And then, of course, um, you know, you have law enforcement there, you have private security there, and then working with the business community uh, to make sure that they protect their assets as well, their businesses, right, and the safety of their guests and customers. Um, and um, unfortunately, it's going to take some hard enforcement, strict enforcement. Some's not going to like it to make sure that we get control of this. And then you have an orderly crowd. People can come down here for spring break, enjoy themselves, uh, and and truly get what they want. Right? Get on the beach. You know, use the jet skis. Go to the restaurants. You know, listen to music, have a good time. We want that, but we got to make sure people are safe. Well, I had I spent time in Alabama and I uh, spent time of, uh, with responsibilities for Florida newspapers, and so I'm quite aware of the the issues that Florida and Alabama have dealt with. And um, and I will point out, it's not about race. I mean, spring break has a tendency, no matter what color you are, it has a way of creating some turmoil. And Florida has been real strong on how they've dealt with it. Miami more recently had big issues, and I was really pleased, actually, to see that the chief of police for the Miami Police Department reached out to Chief Miller almost immediately, well, actually, the next day, and provided his uh, input. Uh, Alabama's been very, very stringent in how they've dealt with it. we got to do it, too. One of my concerns is, and I hope that, I hope that uh, through this sort of one-coast approach, that whatever, whatever Gulfport and Biloxi come up with, I hope it's similar. Because you don't want one city having one thing in place and another city having something else in place. We all coast mayors have to come together and say, here's going to be our coast approach so that what will happen if we don't do that, which is what happened in Florida and it certainly began to happen in, in Alabama, is they find the weaknesses. And that's where the congregating will take place. And hopefully we can get to the bottom of it. But I'm I'm really pleased that FOFO is providing terrific leadership. I know Billy's thinking hard about this. The city council is heavily engaged. we got a good police chief in, in uh, we're all across the coast of Mississippi that are engaged in this, these conversations. I think we can come up with something that will that will work and maybe stop the violence. I didn't say that. This is, this is National Law Enforcement uh, Week. Uh, you know, 443 names were read yesterday at the Law Enforcement Memorial in Washington, D.C. Uh, two of those names right here in coastal Mississippi and basically yeah. yeah. uh, officers have a tough job. Uh, if I can't say anything else ending today, support public law enforcement, please. 100 percent, man. This has been great. Great conversation. Wendy Sweatman from Sweatman Security. Have a great day and we will see you tomorrow.